The town of Wallace celebrates its rich history with tours through a maze of silver mines. A cameo man fiddles around with his favorite hobby, building hand-carved instruments. And it's a slice of the Old West. We'll round them up on a modern day cattle drive. Hello, and welcome to Exploring Idaho. We are going to cover a lot of ground today. From Wallace to Kamii, Weezer to Hagerman and Haley, we have so many stories to tell that we invited reporter John Miller along to help us out. You know, I checked the car odometer and learned that we traveled nearly 1,200 miles to get to all those stories. I believe it. Once you start driving in Idaho, you do realize just how big our state is. And a lot of interesting people there mm -hmm. and a lot of interesting and fascinating stories that we learned about our state. And we'd like to start off by telling you some of the stories from Wallace, Idaho. We found out that this part of our state really does contain a silver lining. Everywhere you look in Wallace, you see this town's connection to silver mining, and with good reason. The mines in this area have produced a billion ounces of silver in less than 100 years. You can see and hear the story firsthand on the Sierra Silver Mine Tour. We tagged along on a school field trip. These Kellogg fourth graders have been studying Idaho history all year. They are today, too, but today they're also tourists in their own backyard. Their trip aboard this old San Francisco trolley begins in the heart of Old Wallace, a town built around silver mining and the railroad. You see where the students are going in over there at the depot? That's the that's Northern Pacific Depot. It built about 1905. The uh, brick that they used in the construction of the depot was brought over from China. On your left, you see the melodrama, live theater. That's the old Lux Theater, dates back to the late 1800s. That is the only wood structure left in the city limits of the town. Just a short drive outside those city limits is the site of the Sierra Silver Mine. Hi, kid. Hi. Hi. Step off over here and grab a hard hat. And grabbing a hard hat isn't just for looks. This is a real silver mine, and safety is foremost. This here is probably the most important stop in the whole tour. It's a safety area. It is? Safety, yes it is. Safety is the number one priority that a miner is taught, to, is taught underground. We asked one of those miners, George Barrett, to take us on ahead for a look at the life miners led in these tunnels. He spent 28 years here. I'm in here for 10 minutes and I'm kind of claustrophobic. Uh -huh. 28 years working in a mine. I mean, does it take a certain kind of person to be able to do that? No, it's just in this area that uh, it's well life. Is it a good life? Yeah, I liked it. Now you're taking kids on tours and telling them about that. And these kids have been studying Idaho history why is that important for them to understand? Well, because it was our way of life. It's our heritage. That heritage is one of danger and daring. You can see the pride in George's eyes when he talks about it and as he wheels around this eight-ton mucking machine. This is the most dangerous piece of equipment in the mine. If there was such a thing as a widowmaker, this machine would have that name, widowmaker. But all machinery can be a widowmaker if it's misused. George hopes people will want to hear his stories of the old mining ways because he says for the most part they're over. And now he and others are building what they hope will be a gold mine, tourism. Idaho's history is mining. At one time you'll see our signs downtown says silver capital of the world. It was the silver capital of the world. The world's silver came right from the Wallace, Idaho area. 
That's the truth. And you know, under Wallace and around Wallace, there are 200 miles of tunnels, all used to get out those precious metals. Long, tough places to work, yeah. I imagine. And the men who worked there obviously needed a place to let loose when they got out of those tunnels. And there is one business in Wallace that found a way to capitalize on that. Wallace is pretty quiet these days, but that's not how it used to be. It was miners. The mines were terrifically rich around here. People were making a lot of money, and it was bringing men from everywhere, and not many women. <laughs> That's why this business probably flourished. The brothel business, that is. Michelle Mayfield is the, uh... Chief Madam. At the Oasis Bordello Museum, emphasis nowadays on the word museum. This whole, whole area of town was off limits anybody respectable. It was bad. It was 1895 when the place opened and the basement tells the story of bootlegging and crawl spaces with coffins just below the first floor which became a casino and right there on that spot. Underneath that there used to be a trap door with a chute and when the authorities would come in the gamblers would simply drop this money down this chute into a bag. That's where Jack Mayfield dug up these bottles of booze and brown gunk. And I have no idea what it is. That's pretty scary in itself, huh? You bet it is. This is a real raunchy building. Yes, it really is. And that's only the downstairs. It doesn't cost nearly as much to get upstairs these days, does it? Oh, no, and looky there, you get more time. And speaking of time, the oven timers the girls used look pretty modern. So do the rooms and the groceries in the kitchenette. There's some of the swimsuits that they wore. Those don't look that old. <laughs> no, hey, this closed down in 1988. 1988? 1988. 1988. Sort of a sorted past we have here in Wallace. You see, things here are much quieter than they used to be just seven years ago. I think everybody's sort of glad they're gone. You know, Dee, it's funny, I'm told a lot of the old clientele comes back and they're a little bit surprised to find out that nowadays the Oasis is just a museum. A bordello museum. That's right. Kind of an odd thing. It is. John, thank you very much. There is still a lot more to see. Exploring Idaho continues in just a moment. Welcome back to Exploring Idaho. It is good to know that old-fashioned craftsmanship is alive and well in Idaho. And it's really all over the mm. place. I went looking for some of that handcrafted spirit, and I found a man who really captures the rugged beauty of Idaho in his art. To find him, you just need to follow your ears to the southwest corner of Kamii. There you'll meet Lowell Kurtz, who has an ear and an eye for the fiddle. Maybe you wouldn't expect to find world-class fiddles in this valley. Maybe Lowell Kurtz never learned much about fiddle music or read a book on fiddle making. Most people don't make fiddles with pocket knives, I wouldn't imagine. Well, that's all I had. <laughs> Maybe that's all he had when he cut out his first fiddle 25 years ago. Maybe that's all he has now, but he's come a long way. How do these compare with uh, fiddle made by Stradivarius? They're better. Who said so? Well, I said so. And around here, you don't get many arguments. Sure, Lowell will admit his fiddles aren't the prettiest in the world. I've always shot more for quality than for beauty. Maybe most fiddle makers wouldn't build their fiddles with seven strings or clamp them together with clothespins or color them with writ dye or chalk up their fishing line bows with a piece of pine bark. And I've got eight pound monothalon in it. But Lowell Kurtz would. They don't know any more about it than I do. I don't think you can get anything better. This is the best I've ever seen. I find that you can make them out of pertinent anything. Now I've made them out of cedar, birch, maple, black walnut. I just go out here in the brush and find what I want.
And maybe Lowell Kurtz carves that wood into the best fiddles you'll find anywhere. Maybe Stradivarius would be impressed. Maybe the world will never know. Lowell is still building guitars and violas and banjos and fiddles. And oddly enough, he got his start about 25 years ago when he broke his neck in four places during wow. a logging accident. Kind of a heck of a way to get started. It is, but what an art. Really, really interesting. using a pocket knife, imagine that. Wow. John, thank you very much. You know, when you're traveling around Idaho, it's always fun to know those little places to stop for goodies to take home. So I'm going to tell you about a wonderful candy maker in Weezer with this warning. Her candy may not make it all the way home with you, but some extra pounds might. If only you could smell what you're seeing right now. It's the smell of homemade fudge, rich and sweet, just like mom used to make. My mother just taught me when I was a little girl. And she just made really good candy ever, ever since I was tiny and taught me when I was just young. And so I knew the rules of making candy just as a tiny girl. And Fawn Olson learned her lessons well. Her fudge is a big hit here in Weezer. What do we have? Fudge. We just made fudge. Oh, thank you. And you'll find Fawn's fudge lovers around the world. She exports her fudge and 65 other homemade candies as far away as Taiwan. But it takes more than luck to cook up a successful candy business. Fawn says science plays a big role, from temperature to humidity, Making candy is an exacting technique. Candy is chemistry, and you have rules and laws that you follow to have success, and if you don't, it fails every time. And you have to know what to look for. Vaughn says making fudge is a lot like raising children. It goes through several stages. It goes through infancy, and then just before it's perfect fudge, it goes through adolescence. Puberty. Yeah. It looks like it's the worst fudge that ever was and it acts terrible <laughs> and you just beat it good and it becomes a great fudge. <laughs> but you don't have to worry about that. Fawn says raise your kids and let her make the fudge. And John one day Fawn was looking at that big glob of fudge and she said hmm that kind of looks like a cow pie. <laughs> and thus was born the famous Fawn's Fudge Cow Pie. They sell all over the country and everybody gets a good laugh. Now you ate one. I trust they taste oh. a little bit better than they look. You know, they are so good. I can't tell you. You'll have to check them out for yourself. Well, maybe. <laughs> Stay with us. Exploring Idaho will return after this. <laughs> shot looks like something straight out of an old John Wayne movie. Yeah, but cowboys are real in Idaho because ranching is one of our state's strongest industries. In central Idaho, farmers and ranchers have been working land that's been in their families for 100 years or more. Near Haley, we saddle up for one of those old traditions, the cattle drive. Oh, cattle. And every time I get up in the morning, I have something to do. Ow! Oh, oh, come back! I don't have to worry about what I'm going to do. I have to do something and keep you going. Huh? Out on the range, it takes fast moves and a unique language to round up cattle. Watch out. Watch it. And at nearly 80 years old, Bud Purdy has a lot of practice. Oh! Ha! 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 He's been working this land since the Great Depression, and in 60 years, he's never let a cow get the best of him. Well, almost never. Today, the newest addition to the K-Bar K Ranch is moving out. These calves and their mamas are headed to another range for the summer, but some are a little confused about which way to go. The calves, they don't, they want to run back. They don't want to go. A crew of cowboys helps Bud bring his cattle in. And another helper is a little camera shy, but not so shy about nipping cows into line. Get them salt. Get them out of there. Today's drive is a short one. 
how we made it anyway. And back at the corral, cowboys trade their horses for cattle prods. And with a poke, a push, and only one escape, herd the cows into a chute, up into a truck, and off to the range down the road, where they'll do it all again another day. With the hard work finished for today, Bud takes a walk along Silver Creek. There's some yellow blackbirds there, yellow winged or yellow headed. They just showed up. Nearly seven miles of this creek run through his property. It's home to dozens of birds, trout, even muskrat, a healthy stream for all the cattle that graze nearby. We're just kind of paying attention to what we're doing. I think that's the main thing. Fences keep cattle from tromping the creek bed. Willows planted at water's edge offer shade and habitat for insects. Those insects make good food for trout. I want someone to enjoy them in the future, just like I have. And, uh, that's, that's really what, what I want. The fishing was good 100 years ago when Bud's grandfather homesteaded this land. Today, Silver Creek remains one of the best fishing streams in the area. And Bud Purdy stands out as an example to other ranchers of how to work the land and care for the land. So again and again, his family can hand it down. When I'm gone, I just, I just love to think, think that this uh, stream would be like this for right on through, whatever that is. The Purdy's work on Silver Creek has earned them national recognition. Last year, the Purdy's won an Environmental Stewardship Award. The National Cattle Association honored them as the premier example in the Northwest region for their work to protect Silver Creek. About a hundred years ago, Bud Purdy's grandfather homesteaded that land, and it doesn't end there. His son works on the ranch, his grandson is in the irrigation business, and John Bud tells us that just last month, his six-year-old great-grandson saddled up for his very first cattle drive. It is quite a tradition mm -hmm. they have over there. Indeed. You know, Dee, we've been talking a lot on the show about traditional trades, and I found one Idaho family for whom tradition is especially important. And if you're a collector or you just appreciate a fine piece of handmade art, there is a place in Hagerman that you will not want to miss. It's called Snake River Pottery, and it's just off the highway on the way into town. And this year, thousands of people will come from all over the world to visit. Why? Well, it has a lot to do with the pottery itself, but also with the philosophy Dritch and Trudy Bowler spin into every piece. When you pull into Snake River Pottery, the first thing you'll see is this gone fishing sign. That's because Trudy Bowler has been fishing for five years straight. She's got quite a catch to show off. I'd say about 400. Yeah. About 400 little fish, big fish. They have ceramic heads on the roof, suns on the wall, more fish on the floor. The minute we put it out, it's gone. Traffic around here got so thick, the highway department told Dritch Bowler to put out TODs. And I said, what are TODs? They're those blue signs that designate major tourist attractions. How big a tourist attraction? We had a postcard from Italy once, just mailed to the Snake River Pottery USA. And it got here. <laughs> Maybe they come for Trudy's oh. fish or Dritch's bowls or pieces by other Magic Valley craftsmen. You can find those here too. But there's something else here you won't find in too many places anymore. I'm a problem solver. Uh -huh. Ideas drive me. They drive me harder than my legs will go now. <laughs> Starting out here uh, with nothing after World War II, uh, I had to invent and make all the machinery. And now 80-year-old Dritch Bowler is just getting into tile making with clay he'll dig up just downriver. And I said, why can't that be done with a hydraulic ram? How many 80-year-olds do you know who build their own hydraulic ramps? Oh, boy. <laughs> the result will no doubt bring even more people from even more places. Maybe they'll come just for the view or a piece of Magic Valley art or for the people who mold it all together. As long as my head works, 
<laughs> I can do it. And they say this is the peak season for seeing pottery as well as a lot of the wildlife that you'll find around here. So if you're in the area, the bowlers invite you to come on out and browse. And really, Rich is kind of a fixture in Hagerman. He really is. He's been around for 47 years making his pottery, so he must be doing something, right? Just one of the things to see in Hagerman. And coming up next, we'll tell you how you can get more information on all of the stories you've seen on today's Exploring Idaho. Welcome back. Here's how you can get more information on the stories you've seen on today's show. Call 1-800-443-2461 and ask for the field notes for show number 125. And here's a tip for all you explorers. This is one of the most beautiful springs in years for wildflowers. And you know, Dee, I know a spot right up in the Boise foothills where they are growing like crazy. So we're going to take you on a short walk through the wildflowers as we close today's show. Thanks for being with us.